So I'll start by saying that I feel very privileged to have what I call work or career um, wrapped together or weaved into a lifestyle that I live, a hobby. Um, it's not many people, and my purpose too, and a calling. It's not many people who can stand and say the work I do is my purpose, and this purpose pays my bills, and it's also an inspiration to my lifestyle, and it's a hobby. Sometimes I wonder why I get paid. Because I, I'm just sitting and listening and providing space, and I'm like, okay, when I'm, I'm getting paid for this, I could do this for free for a lifetime. That's what coaching makes me feel, and really fills my heart. But it has not always been like this. I've not always been in that privileged position. And that's why I'm very, very grateful to God for having given me that gift. I call it a gift. Now that my, my, my predecessor spoke about their childhood, I wasn't planning to speak about it, but maybe to inspire somebody as well. So I grew up with a foster mother for the first 14 years of my life. Um, and I can't, you know, I used to call her grandma and I'm not big enough to know she wasn't just a grandma, but she was my foster mother. And when I actually got to discover that or to get that awareness, she's rested, but I mourned her fresh. Just feeling like I didn't do enough. I didn't honor her enough as a mother because she was a grandma. And by the time I was discovering, she was the mother and possibly the most loving mother, you know, I'll ever have. It was very, it was very sad. But then I said, I've got the future ahead to pay it forward. And that's the part that I'm on now. I'll leave the rest of the details of what happened between um, 15 and married life. Married life. Um, but if you'd like to hear that part, please see me behind the tent, <laughs> as they say in Kenya. So, how did it all begin? You know, with all these accolades of priests talking about, where did it all begin? The beginning was tough. Tough because I was so restless. I was on my third job, and everybody around me thought I was doing so well, and that God had been very gracious to me. And for me to be thinking that I'm not happy and fulfilled, I must be very proud and God must be angry with me. I should be angry with me. But deep down I knew this was not it. There was something deep that told me, Eileen, you're made, you're made for greater things. I was feeling I really want to impact and make a transformation in my generation and beyond. And so I lived in that tension of, there is the expectation by everyone that I'm doing well, um, my career is on the rise, and I was the kind of uh, candidate who, when I went for an interview, my friends used to say the worst thing you can do is just invite her in for an interview, because as soon as she walks, you shall give her that job. So I, I got the jobs I wanted, um, and I did exceptionally well uh, to the place. Sometimes I know my, my probation letter would be recalled and I'd be promoted, because I was a, I was a performer. But as, as all that was happening around me, something deep down was telling me this is not it. And I developed a slogan, uh, which my husband uses until today, and it was, there has to be a better life. There has to be a better life. And when he asked me what is this better life, I said, a life of fulfillment, a life of meaning, a life of impacting and changing lives. And at some point, I wondered whether I was being called to be a pastor or to be, to be in ministry. Just was like maybe I need to be, maybe I need to be somewhere else, not not in the not in the in the mainstream career. But I and I believe and understand that there is no better calling as a career as the work pastors and people like yourselves, Bishop, do. But at that time, I was just not thinking it's a very serious career. I'm getting I'm like, should I go here? I'm like, no, that's not. I'm not, I don't think even I'm a pulpit. I'm a very I'm an introvert, by the way. Uh, so I don't think I would be the person to go and do that. And by the way. I had a very good grounding as a Christian, as a child. My grandmother was born again. Um, my mom, my foster mother was born again. And uh, she didn't know, she couldn't read, she was, she was illiterate. So um, I read the Bible for her. So I became very conversant with the Bible at a very early age. I sang in church, uh, in Sunday school. Um, just as, like my, that, my kids think I don't have a voice to sing, but I used to sing. 
and do drumming. I can still, you know that traditional drum that, you know, in the village, I can still do that. You give it to me, I'll produce music for you. Uh, because I grew up in the village. And there was a lot of consuming the word of God as a child. And I actually believe my first vision as a Christian happened when I was in the field taking, cow or taking care of cows and, cows and sheep. But that's a story for another day. So, coaching. I'm on my third job, as I said. I am agitated, I'm, I am restless, and I'm wondering, what am I seeking for? And through my quest for an answer, I came across this thing called, it was, it was career coaching, and I said, hmm, what I need is actually a career coach. Because I've tried these jobs, I've gotten the best, but I still feel like it's not it. So my search narrowed down to looking for a career coach. Shock on me, I couldn't find any in Kenya. And the few that I was sent to, they were called career counselors and uh, recruitment agencies. And all they were looking for is to get me another job. And I was like, no, I'm not looking for a job. In fact, when I need a job, I get one. So I'm looking for a deeper conversation. And now that I'm mature enough, I think I was looking for a conversation to do with my meaning uh, in life, my purpose in life and what I'm here for. And what is this, what is this, what is this itch that I have? What is this loose foot footedness all about? And nobody around me was understanding. Even my husband, as, as, as somebody, he asked me, what is this thing you're looking for? I couldn't explain it, but I just knew there was a better life. And this better life was not about to do with money, to do with rank, it was to do with meaning, to do with impact, to do with transformation. So in my search, I came across books that spoke about career coaching. So I looked for a career coach, there was none in Kenya. I tried to get one from abroad and the rates that I, <laughs> the internet was not as good as it is today. Those who are in my generation, they know that. So you go to a cyber and Google and wait, you know, and there is a queue and you are counting shillings. Uh, they're counting minutes and every minute, it was I think two shillings or something. So that was hard search. Finally, I came across a contact. Now, I was supposed to be coached on the phone and the calling rates were about 65 shillings per minute. The fee note was, for the youngsters, you, may not think, you cannot even wrap this around your heads. Yes, it was 65 shillings to call abroad per minute. And imagine an hour with my, little, with my salary then. I mean, it was a little, but it was still, that was a big deal. Then you are paying this person. I think I had a bill of $750. So I did the math, I was like, hey, come on, I can't afford this. So I tried South Africa, and they didn't take me seriously for whatever reason. And so I was very lost, knowing there is something else I could do to better my career and to find the meaning that I'm looking for, but I can't afford it. So the next, the next question to myself was then, now that I know there is a, there's a career in coaching, and there are people, I'm sure I'm not alone, there are other people like me, what, what if I became? What if I became? And I spoke to my husband who told me, hey, <laughs> I was about to say to use the pet name he uses, but I opposed. So he told me, uh, you know, this is Kenya. If this thing was actually possible, there would be many people doing it. And I asked him, what if I was the first one? And of course, he left me alone and said, this one, whatever, whatever brand she's smoking, it's very cheap. Um, but I didn't give up. And, and I asked him to register for me a business, which he did. Uh, but he sat me down and told me, I want to put sense in your head, Irene. You can't afford to leave your good job. I had a very good job at that point uh, to actually go start a thing that nobody knows and nobody talks about. Let others start, you know? Let the market, the market will take it up. As, if, it's, if, if, if it's real, at some point it will take up, then you can come out. Said, okay. So I decided the next time I want to do this, I'm not telling him. So, and in the meantime, I enrolled for an online coaching uh, certification. And I started, to, I started learning and, you know, this thing called coaching and what it is. And I was so wowed. It's like everything started falling together for me. And remember, I have a job. So I bought my first laptop. Well, laptops were special then. I bought my first, my first laptop simply because I wanted to interact with my clients off work. And because I'm a woman of integrity, 
There's no way I would do that during the working hours. I had to wait for the day to end, then I go home or and you know and, and get in touch with the people that I'm coaching now and I'm excited about and you know yeah and I had to buy something called a modem that which was costing 18,700 uh, never mind how much how much uh, internet was costing I, I can't the figures were just crazy but I was so I had never been passionate in my life about anything like I was and one time I asked myself Eileen you're doing this, so you're spending your best of the hours of the day doing something that you're not enjoying, looking forward to the evening to do something that you're enjoying. What if you change your life and it's the other way around? That you, you spend the best, the best part of your day doing, doing what you're enjoying doing. And so um, I thought I can't go back to my husband and talk about this again. And at that time, my friends were all referring their friends to me. Like, oh, so I started with my, my, my circle of friends and then they started telling their friends. So at some point I was meeting people who know somebody that I don't know. No, it's people I don't know, but they know somebody that I know. Oh, my friend, my friend to someone. So people would call and say, you know, my name is Pri. I'm a friend to your, um, I'm a friend to your friend, you know, Margaret. And she told me, you know, and that was so, I, my, I, think, I think it's for the first time my, my soul was thrilled and I knew that better life I was looking for is in this thing. So I, I, I had done business, uh, business uh, master's degree in business, 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 and my degree was in economics. And I had done a bit of CPA until part one. I didn't go beyond that point. So I'm a dropout, I'm a dropout in CPA class. So I sat down and prepared a business plan. I was checking how much money do I need to actually set up an office. So I wasn't going to work from home. In fact, there was no working from home those days. So I need an office, I need, um, need a desk. What else do I need? I need a receptionist. So I did my business plan and <laughs> I saved the money towards this idea. So I didn't ask my husband at the point I was resigning. I just came and told him, yeah, um, I'm actually resigning. And I told him, just allow me to try this thing. If it doesn't work, you know, it's okay, I still have my papers, I still have my experience, I still have my networks, just a lot. let me just get over this. And he told me, okay, what if you don't make money? He said, you'll feed me and feed the children. I think that's what you're supposed to be doing. So if I start, now, if I start thinking as if I'm not, I'm not gonna make money from now on. And it was a very, that was a very uh, serious turning point because um, naturally because of my childhood, I'm very independent. So getting to a place of surrender and saying you're going to depend on someone was a big decision for me. So I leave work and oh, when I, did, when I resigned, that time I have two sons. Um, my boss, no, I take leave, I had some leave days. So I take my leave days and um, when I'm on leave, uh, I notice something. And I go to see, I don't know, absolutely you're actually expectant. Uh, but I had already submitted my, uh, my resignation. So I tell my boss, I can't come back to work because, you know, I'm supposed to come back to work and find, find, wind up things, but the doctor says I'm expectant and yeah, we were pregnant. Yeah, that's the, the, the term I have learned today. The doctor says we must, you know, I must take a bed rest for two weeks. So my boss told me, okay, let's talk when you come. I'm not, submit, I'm not giving you a letter. I said, okay. So I'm back, she told me, um, you know what I mean? I'm a gender proponent and, and she meant well. I can't allow you to resign now, expectant, and you go ahead, because what are you going to do? At least push for the next nine months, I'll give you easier tasks, um, get your baby, we have six months maternity leave, thereafter you can decide, in fact there was even a maternity package, you can decide whether you want to resign or not, because even I'm not even trusting your, your judgment right now, maybe you have some hormonal issues and imbalances that you are experiencing. So I sat with her and told her, you know, I really appreciate your wanting to support me, but I feel I'll be getting off, getting off my, my grid of integrity if I sat here all because I have, I have, I'm in a state of, you know, I'm needy and I'm not because I want to continue doing what I'm doing. So just allow me to go. I think God will take care of me, but I really appreciate um, what you what you are your thoughts around me so just submit that submit that resignation and so with my baby and 
no job and my little business plan and little savings, I leave employment. And that was this, uh, November 20, 2006. No, yes, November 2006. And I had leave, I mean, I had extra days because I think I had not taken leave, but so it ended December, but actually I, I stopped working in November. And the first thing I did was to look for an office, set up an office at a place in Parklands. And yeah, I started putting adverts in the newspapers and yeah, that day, those days, digital marketing was not, was not very uh, consistent as it is today. So I put these adverts and I get people responding, uh, but they're not paying. Um, oh, I forgot to tell you, when I, when I got the office, I had always been an office like say, that set up, it has staff. So I didn't know you actually fix your floor, you, you find your staplers and staples and anything, you know, everything you find. I've always walked into an office that was set. So when I was doing my business plan, I didn't plan for all these things. So what I thought would take me for six months, let's just say in two months I was broke. And um, yeah, there I was. And I'm thinking my husband was possibly right. But you know what? I'm, I'll give this, I'll give this my all. At some point, I could see he's struggling, but I just kept praying for grace. It took six months before I got my first client. And if you're doing your math, you can suspect how old, how old my pregnancy is at that point. You're about due, you, <laughs> you know? And I remember, you know, gosh, this is a long, how much time do I have pre? So, um, finally, you know, you know babies don't wait. When nine months come, ready or not, they come. And I remember putting an advert on the newspaper and, you know, as I was doing and going for maternity with a feel, okay, so CS is happening on this day. It's set before 2nd of July. And so after that, I'll take a week, then I'll go back to the office and um, maybe two weeks, but I have the model I can work for mom. So I did all these maths. Shock on you, I go to the hospital and we have complications. And so we are in hospital for, for the 10 days. Uh, in fact, I left, when I left the hospital, it was actually uh, against the doctor's advice. I just said I need to go home, I'm tired of being, being in the hospital. If it gets worse, I'll come back. And, and actually, you know, one of, the, I think on the fourth day, I'm not a Catholic, on the fourth day, I was so sick in the night that I asked, I was in mat and I asked, can they go for me a priest? I thought I'm going to die. And just to tell him my final words and what to tell the father to, the father to the child and I'm going, I'm for sure dying. So they, they went to call the, the priest, he was not found. Um, so, because it wasn't my last day anyway. So finally I got better and uh, my immunity was highly compromised, but I got better and went home. As soon as we landed home, the, my husband, has, remember now we don't have a cover. My husband is a businessman and we, we've, we've never taken those medical covers seriously. So he had just paid a very hefty, hefty bill. Uh, at the hospital and then we get home and somebody delivers the invoice for the office for three months <laughs> so my poor husband so he told me now sweetie baby is here finally you get well but this is the last this is the last um, rent i'm paying for you you know <laughs> you now can go back and look for work because i mean this thing is not working and i told him it's okay so that morning he left to go to work after he had given me soup and everything. It's a very nice house. You should have been here to hear this story. Pre, you shall share the recording. But when he left, I, we were on a, an apartment, uh, I think second floor or something. After he left, I watched, and when he left, I, I knelt down. And I told God, <laughs> can I say it in mother tongue? And you, you all will not understand. So, but I told God, I'm not going to repeat what he has told me. <laughs> because you've had but beyond this point i'm trusting you yeah that i shall never ever ask for rent again for my office and i think is those those tea, I, 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 I never prayed with so much groaning I, I think it felt like my dream is again dying and i know this is the place i'm supposed to be but what's interesting i didn't doubt god in fact if anything i surrendered to him and as they say, the, the past, that's, that's all history. I've never gotten to ask for rent. Um, I never got to borrow 
money for anything to do with the business, God has actually been very faithful. And I truly believe that I was meant to be where I am. I had some notes here just for reference, just to give you the journey that I've been on. That's the background to it, that it started with a lot of, a lot of hardships. And I, I know that I mentioned that there's a year I worked for three companies in search of this meaning. Up to April, I had one job. Up November, I had another one. And December, no, October, November, I had another one. Because I was trying to look for this meaning. It was actually very, it was a real restlessness I've not experienced again. So what did it take? I think one of the things is that I remained true to myself. And when everybody thought what was, what was conventional was what was, I was leaving behind, I had such a deep conviction that my calling was different. And I know a lot of people get that tension of where they are being called and what everybody around them is saying, you know? But I had such a deep conviction and generally speaking, I'm like that. When I have a calling in a certain area, it doesn't matter what other people think. Unless God himself came and stopped me, I'll still get to move. But it does, everybody has that gift of being able to, be, to remain true to themselves. It also took, um, I mean, sh sacrificing short-term gains for long-term, you know, for long time, for long-term impact. When I left my last job, um, everybody thought I was crazy. But my backstepping, I would relate this with the way you can be on the wrong route, and my son is called route, <coughs> on, the, on the wrong route and you're accelerating, but going in the wrong direction. So sometimes, no matter what people are thinking, it's okay to stop and take a back step and re go back to where you are supposed to be going, because then if you go to the wrong direction, then it's not even worthwhile. There was commitment and investment heavily. Um, I ran my credit card to the last drop, paying for programs that would empower me and make me help me do what I was going. And I am truly grateful for my husband for still, he believed in my vision and he could not understand what I was talking about. And by the way, that time coaching was not known. Not like now everybody calls themselves coaches. Coaching was not known at all. So he was like, this thing, in fact, he used to call it this thing. <laughs> I think grit and courage, uh, letting go of all the titles. My last job, I was being it was a GM role, and letting go of all that and starting afresh. You know, like starting afresh, really. Going to school to do things, you know, economics, uh, strategy, leave it behind, go learn this thing called coaching. Um, and there's a lot of sacrifice I had to make even at a personal level from, from a lifestyle perspective. There are things I had to stop doing. Um, I discovered that you can make hair around the corner in the estate. Um, I discovered a remis can also work um, <laughs> as good as other things, but I must also commend my husband for all the support. And sometimes you need to even figure out who around you is your support. I, I think I lost a lot of my friends um, at that point because they couldn't understand what I was doing and they didn't want to associate with somebody who seemed they were going backward. But God is gracious. There are two friends who stood with me and they're still my friends to date. And one of them called Grace. Or she would come, she would come and just you know, sit with me and ask me, how are you doing? Hang in there. She didn't tell me, but she just told me, hang in there, hang in there. In fact, today we, say, we still say, hang in there. Because she also didn't understand what exactly I was, I was trying to do, but like, okay, sounds good. In fact, she's the one who taught me to start charging because at some point I was like, should I even be charging for these things? But being a business person, she told me, no, just charge them something little, just to clean your carpet, if not even to take to the bank, yeah? And, and in the process, I gained the confidence. I, and by investing more in myself, and I speak to people who may actually be in the room and wanting to get into coaching, go it full throttle, it pays off, yeah? It pays off, it's a journey worth every bit of the investment. Because then moments you develop yourself, you develop your confidence, you bring your clients bigger impacts, and you develop your own credibility. I wouldn't be where I am today, in the, even in the global space, if I hadn't actually taken time to develop myself. So those are some of the things that it has taken. The regret I have is that I wish I was more centered um, in God and in my faith as I was starting this journey. Yes, I was a Christian, but I didn't have the kind of relationship I have with God now. 
that's my only regret. You know, as Margaret said, I wish I stayed on the course of faith, you know, from, from six. Um, I was born, I, was, I said I was brought up in my, in my Christian, as a Christian little girl, um, believer, spoke in tongues then, um, but still I drifted. I think teenage and staff have a way of taking stuff from, you know, it's just a season again. Uh, plus, I think the environment I was in from 15 years to um, about finishing campus was also a very, it didn't bring me closer to God. It took me away, further away from God. But who is God? He's so gracious. So I still, you know, when they say teach your children, I think the seed that my foster mother planted in me, it, it's kind of, it's, it was doing magic. I still knew there's God, there was a God, a God who hears prayers. I could still pray, I knew how to pray. I could read the word of God, I could sing. I knew things to do with God, but I didn't have a deeper relationship with God like I have today, knowing him as my father and having that deep conviction that I'm so loved and that you're not competing for his love with anybody else. I am loved as who I am. So that's my regret. But then as I regret, I'm also grateful for the grace of God that continued to follow me. Some of the milestones along this journey, and as I speak about milestones, you, you'll notice I'll weave in business and personal, because I said I have a business that's a lifestyle, that's a hobby, you know, that's me, you know. Um, just in 2009, I remember being nominated for Top 40 Under 40 as one of the women who have the capacity to influence, you know, leadership in this, in this region. And when I was called by Business Daily for an interview, I told them like, it must be a wrong number. Because I don't, I don't, who, who nominated me? And I, they said, no, people have nominated me. Who, who, which people? I was very, actually I was very stubborn. And I told them, if you want me to take that interview, come with the nominations here. And because I mean, unless you guys cook these things, who nominated me? You know? And, and they, they actually sent, sent them to me. And guess what was the reason I was nominated? is that people had impacted with coaching between 2007 and 2009, who are saying there is somebody somewhere who is actually transforming lives, one life at a time. I was like, okay. I think it was like a moment of, indeed, this is where I'm supposed to be. Never mind I was broke. But I, 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 got, I got myself on the Kenyan newspapers for the first time, and I was being, I mean, for, for, for a worthwhile reason, I think that's the very time, the very first time I used the name Laska. And people wondered, who is this Laska? So Laska was my stepfather, he's late as well. Um, but a very, I mean, he adored me, he treated me well, and have a lot of, um, yeah, he may he rest well. So that's the time I agreed to use his name. And the reason I had, was not using the name before is because, as you can tell, the name is not, is not African. Uh, so even if people see Eileen Laska, they expect a white. Uh, but even with, so, so you can see how, how dark I am. So I even told him not to come to campus because people would think I have a sugar daddy who is coming to see me in campus. And who is he? He still showed up. Um, I was feeling like I, I, I am not like the rest of the, the rest of my siblings. So I, let me just stay with my name. My name is Omboy. So uh, is that on record? So, <laughs> we shall edit that part. So um, yeah. So he said you know, though you've used this name late, you've used it well. You know, I'm told he drank himself crazy because he's seen his name with his daughter on the newspaper. That was 2009. But then what got me here is not the success I had made in my corporate life where I thought I was shining and doing well, it's the little difference I was, I was making people's lives and people's careers. At that point, I got to realize it's not about the size, it's not about the titles, it's really the difference that you're making. And so my question is, how can I empower more people to actually become like the disciples of making a real difference in people's lives? Then moved into training corporates in 2011. Uh, we rebranded the business in 2012 to become CD Africa Coaching Group. Uh, we got international accreditation in 2015. And then in 2018, I achieved the highest credential in coaching, the master certified coach. For context, we are about, I think, 11 or 12 in Africa and um, nine of them are in South Africa, and you can tell the maths, yeah? Um, then I hosted one of, the, one of the regional leadership and coaching conference in 2019. I have multiple global recognitions in terms of being a thought leader in leadership development and coaching. 
and um, 2021, amidst the COVID, I, we worked on a, or that I developed a system that is called the Global Coaching and Leadership Index that is actually transforming the world. So it's been a journey of a step at a time. I can't tell you what I'll be doing tomorrow or the day after. I'm a legit believer of if you, if you can see everything, there's no place for faith. Yeah, there's, there'll, be no, there's, there'll be no need. So I always tell God just enough light for the step that I'm on. What was the major turning point? I think the 2009 for me was a major turning point, having people recognize me for what I had always wanted to do, impact, you know? That was, I think, a major turning point. The other major turning point happened in 2015. So in 2015, I decided to develop a program uh, for executive leaders. And I put the brochure out and said, if you are a CEO, director, MD, you have a program for a coaching program for you, you can be certified as an, a certified executive leadership coach. And because of my the things I had been had gone through as in my childhood, as I did this, I did it fearing and trembling because I like, do I even have what it takes to do this? And about two weeks, no, three weeks before the program began, they had one sign up. Just one. It's like these things that these people cannot even buy. They, they're wondering who is this Eileen? And so this sign up came to the office because they wanted to meet me. And it happened to be a pastor. But I didn't know she was a pastor, she was signing up. Pastor Angie Murenga, maybe you, you, some of you might know her. So she comes to the office and she tells, she asks me, so I didn't I just decided to pass by and say hello as I make the payment. No, as, as I make, I think she was coming to pick the receipt or something. I can't remember, but she decided to pass by. And then she asked me, so how many sign ups do you have? So part of me was telling me to tell her we have many sign-ups we are about to fill. You know how we know how we speak in the marketing language. You have many sign-ups and you know, in fact, the class is full. But part of me told me, be honest. That time she told me she's a pastor. So tell her, you know, you're the first one to pay, but you're trusting God. So let's go to your office and pray. In two weeks, we had 11 people and I was looking for eight. So I still believe her prayers did some magic. And my being one, because if I don't, had I not been honest, she wouldn't have actually prayed. So she prayed, and we get this group of leaders. I won't name them, them but if you go to our website, you might find them there. And the day they're introducing themselves, of course, I was sweating a lot as I was thinking, man, CEOs in the room, what am I going to tell them? Do, am I good enough? You know that kind of thing of, am I good enough? The devil is such a liar. And they stood one after the other talking about their faith in God, God, they are born again, and all the things they've achieved is by the grace of God. And I'm thinking, who are these people? I mean, we came here for leadership. Why are we bringing in matters of God and grace and, and, and whatever? And they took the whole morning talking about that. And it's a kind of, they knew it, of course, you know, CEOs get to know each other. They knew each other. And as I continue to treat, teach these people, there is something so significant that was shifting within my heart. And the realization that your faith and your work, you cannot separate them. And that I got to realize what I'm doing is a marketplace ministry. It's not just work, it's a business, but it's a marketplace ministry that God has given you a platform to transform lives, not just um, monetary because some people get better i mean of course people when they coach they grow fast in their careers and become better in their jobs they become leaders they earn more money but there was a spiritual angle to the work that i was doing that i had not seen but all along it kept work separate from my faith and that's the point i started searching god afresh like seeking god you know i want to be like this who if i asked myself these are the leaders i was so much you know I was a of working with them because of who they are. And here they are, and what they're fronting is their faith. Who am I to keep separating my faith, my spirituality, and work? And that was the birth of praying in our programs, talking about what the Lord is telling people, speaking about a verse that, that coincides with the competency. You know, it, it became just another whole space that I'm so grateful to God for, because he sent a whole army of leaders I could relate with to send me back to his kingdom. So if, if, if nothing else I get from this whole work that I do, 
and I know it's transforming lives. It's just finding my footing back to where I belong. Yeah, it was a place of becoming who I was trying to become and becoming who the Lord really wanted to be. So when you ask what's the most significant you know, thing that has happened in my seasons, I think it's just um, that point of 2015. I've spoken about my husband, so I'm not gonna go back there again. But I've been blessed to have him um, as a cheerleader. Um, he talks about, you know, if you meet him, if you meet him, he'll tell you, you know, this woman is a woman of faith. And, you know, I didn't know how brilliant she was until she got into this space. It's, it's like this place of calling and purpose just revealed somebody that that was always there, but for some reason they could she could not show up. So I feel renewed. I feel fresh. I feel I'm living my life. Um, there were days I used to wish that life could end, but now I want to live longer, see the impact of the work that I do, reach out to more people, uh, impact communities like Margaret is talking about and see the grandchildren. I mean, I'm the only person who talk about the grandchildren here. My kids are, my sons are 25, I'm sorry, 25, 20 and 15. I'm a mother of boys only. That's the reason I wear trousers most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and what has been the impact, the impact for this in Kenya? I think the professional coaching has been greatly, you know, um, been integrated into the society now. It's not, it's no longer a thing that is are hidden and people don't know about it. I have trained thousands of leaders, both in organizations, uh, corporate world, NGOs, uh, marketplace, you know, practitioners, uh, leaders in church. So Bishop, I'll be coming, I'll be coming to Mamlaka because we believe coaching is a minister. There's a lot of coaching that Jesus did in the Bible. There's a lot of reference to that. And um, I can share with you some of the case studies. And more coaching schools are now emerging because CD Africa showed that it's possible. And we are happy to see others going. Some of them have been developed, have been uh, registered by students that have trained. And I get very, very proud to see that they are now getting to a space of multiplication. And I've had two Kenyan companies representing Africa recognized for doing great coaching work in their organizations and transforming leadership. And the coaching narrative, I think, I would say now is being integrated into the narrative of leadership in the organizations and in other, and they say organizations, even schools and anywhere else, you find people talk about, we need coaching for our children, we need coaching for the teachers, we need to actually empower our teachers to use coaching, our pastors use coaching, which really warms my heart because I, my vision is to see coaching as a philosophy, as a language, it, uh, woven into the tapestry of our society. It's not a corporate thing, it's a thing that everyone deserves to have access to. So we plan to actually democratize this. And I know I may not live long enough to see this, but the seed is planted. And we have even a whole new marketplace we are developing now where our coaches can come and market their wares, market their programs, and it's free because I would want to see everybody who needs coaching being able to access coaching. So how would I summarize my seasons as I come to the end? Um, my childhood was grounding. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better mother than the one God gave me because foster mothers are provided by God. And my mother was not able to take care of me. Um, and as you all know, when you don't spend the first six, seven, eight years of your life with your mother, it's a different story. But my, he, she, God gave me a foster mother who I did, I, I think she did herself. She was single, she was barren. I was the only child and she treated me like her own. And I can give you a whole story about my childhood with her. And to date, um, I say the grounding she gave me, the faith grounding she gave me, the hard work, the ethic of hard work, honest, um, and many things is what I still, I think, right on. Then comes my season of lost in the wilderness, because I think even as, as I was in school and doing my degrees, I wasn't sure where I was headed with those degrees. So it was just a wilderness, I was just moving and doing what everybody was doing um, and so that I can get to a job. And I got to a job, but then landed in the world of restlessness. That was another season that was very significant. I mean, when I say restlessness, it was real. Like I, could, I couldn't sleep at night figuring out why am I here. And I don't know why at 28, 29, 30, somebody would be restless. But I think the young generation can understand because I'm seeing them really big on purpose. And you have a husband, you have money, you have a car, but you're restless. Then that was followed with a, with a season of investment. 
you know, I think the whole season of between finding out there is coaching to developing myself, to starting the business, to going through that rough and dry patch, it was a season of planting, weeding. That's what I would call it or investing. The season that we branded and decided we're going to do this for organizations and beyond, beyond one-on-one, on one, that sounds to me like a season of rebranding and renewal, um, like becoming a whole new new thing that had not even envisaged. And I'm trusting God for what is the future. I don't know what it is. So I cannot tell you what really I see in the next few days. I said I live in a world of just enough light of the step that I'm on. Then there was fruit Fruit, fruit, it's called fruity. When a, when a fruit production, what do you call that season? Fruit, fruitfulness, yes. There was a season when, you know, there was fruit, there was a fruit that people could see now, accreditation, training, and a lot of things that were happening, you know, uh, recognitions that I hadn't even envisaged at all. The season that I'm in now, I think I would say it's a season of multiplication. I feel God calling me to a place of scaling the work I've been doing. Uh, God calling me to be able to take a global, global platform and share some of the innovations that um, he's, led, he's given me. Um, I'm very gifted. I'm a creative. I create programs even on the go. And they turn out to be something beautiful. So I feel that's the point I am in. I was just trying to see how can I take this thing that, how can, I, how can, we, how can we export innovation from Africa? And I'm looking for many global stages to go and talk about what we can do as Africans. Because there are a lot of people who don't think that we can export. But uh, we have a system we are, we are exporting now, uh, which we launched last year. And I really want to talk, go around the world and talk about it. I'm also developing a lot of coaches who are now doing the work that I do. So that then, even Jesus did not, did not do all the work by himself. He worked with disciples. So I'm actually now multiplying myself. And I feel like I'm in a season also from a business of letting go so that we can grow. You know, letting go so that others can grow, the, the impact work can grow, and they can also grow in other areas. It's a scary season, but I feel inspired and very convicted that that's what God wants me to do in this season. So, in conclusion, what would I ask you? Um, know your season and be diligent to make it productive. And seasons are very personal. Seasons are very, very personal. You know, that's why some people walk at six months, others walk at kick babies walk at nine months, others never walk until two years. Seasons are very personal. Plus, you know, your background, your family, and many other things happening in your life. Um, everybody has seasons. Just be very sensitive to your seasons. And if you don't know your season, seek the wisdom of the seasons giver. Because God is the one who gives the season. Just seek the, the, the wisdom for, for guidance. And that if you ask him, he'll actually order your, order your steps. So as I said, that my regret was that earlier on I didn't have that wisdom. So I hope as I share, you know, what has happened from the time I discovered this wisdom, I hope that you get something to tell you. As Margaret said, the speaker before me, it's not by ourselves we do these things. It's by the grace and providence of God. And God has a gifting in each one of us. There is something that you are put here to do, and not just for yourself, but also for impacting the world. We all are a piece of a puzzle. And if you place our pieces of puzzles where they belong, then we would make the world a better place. So if you feel a calling to do something, be courageous. The Lord will always walk with you. Thank you so much.